Okay, welcome everyone. I read this room present building reproducible pipelines with R, Dogen, and Nix. Our esteemed speaker today is Dr. Bruno Rodriguez. Welcome. Um, just a little uh, disclaimer for all of you. This talk is recorded and will be posted on YouTube, on our website, uh, and at the in our channel at our ladies room. So feel free to turn off your camera if you don't want to be recorded. We do this because we prioritize creating a safe and inclusive space free from any form of harassment, fostering a respectful environment for everyone to learn and connect. Please remember that all of uh, you are uh, expected to adhere to our code of conduct. You can have a read through at ourladies.org slash COC. Uh, but uh, please, I uh, warmly encourage you to use the chat, say hello, say where you're from, uh, and even um, use the chat for asking questions. What to expect from this talk? Best coding practices, moving beyond script-based workflow for more robust slash solutions. Then we talk about Docker and uh, the techniques for containerizing uh, your analy analysis for consistency and portability. And then finally, Next, which is uh, um, a powerful package a manager that enhances reproducibility both within and outside Docker environments. Welcome to this second July event hosted by Our Ladies Rome. I introduce a bit about myself. My name is Federica Gazzelloni. I am a statistician and also a naturally. Uh, I enjoy organize this workshop tutorials and everything. I'm also a researcher. I'm thrilled to have you all here today. Uh, we have the honor of welcoming our speaker, Bruno Rodriguez, which is the head of the statistics department at the Ministry of Research Higher Education in Luxembourg, who will be sharing his expertise on reproducible pipelines with R, Docker, and Nix. Just I take a bit of a uh, couple of minutes more to introduce about Our Ladies and our chapter. What is Our Ladies? Our Ladies is a global uh, community uh, that has a mission, a mission of promoting the R language, but not only that. So we, our mission and our um, aim is to be able to empowering women at all user level by building a collaborative global network. Uh, it is a friendly community founded in 2012 by Gabriela De Chiaros in San Francisco. Uh, and so uh, we do lots of interesting things. What is Our Ladies Rome? Our Ladies Rome is part of Our Ladies Global. It's a local chapter dedicated in promoting inclusivity in the R language community. Um, we are proud to offer this uh, introductory talks uh, uh, workshops and tutorials totally for free. So our monthly meeting provide a platform to discuss current trends and not topics in R. Our ladies room in numbers. So we started in uh, January 2023, and since then we had a steady uh, growth. So we like to uh, have more followers. Uh, and so I warmly encourage you to follow us on our social network. So we reach 1K plus members on my meetup. Um, we have more than uh, 1,600 reservations and 20 plus events organized. If you want to have uh, like a bit more information about us, you can have a look at our website, ourladiesrome.org. Also, if you'd like to be part of our uh, team, you can, if you if you like that. Uh, and um, keep, uh, keep in touch with us. 
I put this in the chat. Uh, it, it's easy and fast. You just uh, can fill up this form and uh, we will be uh, uh, keeping in touch with you. So we ask just uh, your name, your email, just to have an idea. And if you'd like to be a collaborator or share some ideas, uh, you are warmly welcome. Arledis Rome is, has been funded by uh, an Italian, Claudia Vitolo, uh, which is also a co-founder of Our Ladies Global. But then she couldn't, you know, uh, run the chapter. So, so I did. Uh, and uh, we are um, three organizers at the moment. So me, Federica, and we have Silvana Acosta and Rafaela Ribeiro Lucas. Hello. Thank you. And so next event, uh, so we had a year full of uh, uh, very interesting events about, you know, modeling, um, data science, workflow, debugging R, many things, uh, Quarto, uh, and even an interesting talk with Adley Wigan. So today uh, we are here. The, uh, it's this second uh, July event, and uh, I don't know if we are going to do something in August, but definitely for the end of the year, we expect um, more interesting events with Yarina Bellini Saibene, which is the manager of R Open Science, Julia Stewart Lowness, which is Open Escapes with NASA, and Gwyn Gebeu, uh, which works for. Uh, the government in the US. Okay, so finally, it's time for our uh, event. Today's workshop is led by our expert, Bruno Rodriguez, head of the statistics department at the Ministry of Research and Higher Education in Luxembourg. His background spans across academia and data science consulting, where he has developed a strong foundation in data analysis and research methodologies. Before transitioning to the public sector, Bruno gained valuable experience as data science consultant with one of the big four accounting firms. His career began as a teaching and research assistant, where he developed a strong foundation in data analysis and research methodologies. So we're thrilled to have Bruno share his insight with us today. Thank you. So without further ado, let's get started with Building reproducible pipelines with R, Docker, and Nix. Thank you very much for this uh, very warm uh, uh, welcome and uh, for the opportunity to talk about uh, Docker, Nix, and uh, building, you know, reproducible pipelines, reproducible analysis. Um, I want to make something clear before I start. This is going to go a bit fast because uh, I will be talking about a lot of different topics. They're all related, and I will give you um, some uh, resources that you can consult. And of course, you can then you know, contact me uh, if uh, anything uh, was unclear or if you have further questions. So I apologize in advance because uh, it, it will be intense. But at the same time, uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out uh, afterwards uh, if you need. So I will be sharing my screen here. So I'm on my phone and on my computer. So I hope this is going to work well. Usually it's okay. Uh, I've done this a couple of times, but uh, let's uh, let's see. So uh, I have these slides over here that you should be seeing. So I will uh, move from the slides to uh, our studio, to my terminal, and so on and so forth during the presentation. So uh, first of all, I'm going to give you a, a little introduction. Um, well, who I am, um, that was already said, so I won't go into, into details, but you can find the slides over uh, at these uh, links. Uh, if you don't have time to, to copy them now, no worries. I, I will put them in the chat uh, later, uh, or maybe uh, like, one of the kind uh, organ organizers ca can do it. <laughs> that would be nice. Thank you. Uh, in any case, uh, again, if you if you need to 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 ask something, to find something, don't hesitate. Uh, I will send you the links. 
Um, yes, so the goal of this workshop is to uh, help you identify what you must manage to make an analysis reproducible. I will teach you uh, about different tools uh, that you can use to make that possible, notably R and Vdoka and Nix. Uh, and I will not be talking about too much. I will a little bit, but I cannot really teach you about other concepts such as functional programming, Git, documenting, testing, and packaging your code, and also the targets package. Usually I do the targets package, but I felt it would have been way too much. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to show you code that is already, you know, targets ready, and then uh, I will explain it to you quickly. But again, if there is anything missing, don't, uh, don't hesitate to ask uh, afterwards. The main reference of the workshop is this book that I wrote that you can consult. Um, Thank you. I see that someone posted the uh, the slide link. Um, so this book here, Building Reproducible Analytical Pipelines with R, is the main reference. So you can just you know go to the, this book. It's online. It's free, and uh, you can read it. And it will walk you through absolutely everything. It will walk you uh, through uh, functional programming, RN, Docker, GitHub how to collaborate using GitHub, GitHub Actions, and so on and so on. The only thing that this book doesn't cover is Nix. Uh, but if you go to that link that is highlighted here, you will go to a website, uh, the website of the Rix package. So the Rix package with an R is a package that uh, I've been working on with a colleague called Philip Baumann, and uh, is cur it's currently being reviewed by our OpenSci, and hopefully, it will be on CRAN soon. And this package will help you use Nix from R. And it contains a lot of vignettes. It contains a lot of um, documentation that you can read. So if you read both the book and the vignettes from this package, you will be ready uh, with all of the tools that I will talk to you about today. Uh, in any case, let me, before I continue, clarify also what I mean in this context by reproducibility here, I really mean recovering exactly the same results from an analysis. So if you run the analysis today, if you run it in six months, if you run it in six years or in 60 years, you should be able to uh, get the same results, okay? So that is really what I'm talking about here. Uh, and the question, you know, is why would you want that? Well, maybe, uh, you know, for auditing purposes, right? Uh, Maybe, oh, thank you. I see someone <laughs> purchased the book. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, if you also get an update to the data, right? And if you update the analysis, you should be uh, only getting the results or rather the, the difference in the results should only come from the data update, right? You shouldn't be getting uh, anything else that changes because your, you updated R at the same time, right? If you update R and the data at the same time, you know, and you get a different result. Is it because the data is up to date? Is it because uh, R has been updated or the packages or et cetera, et cetera. So if you update the data, you should only get an update from the data. So that's one thing. Uh, of course, uh, if you're a scientist and I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of you today uh, are uh, in research, uh, you, I don't need to be explaining to you that you know, reproducibility is one of the cornerstones of sciences. And finally, and this is not so much, not something that I will talk too much about it here, but it's something that can be useful. It's also sometimes you just want to work on an immutable development environment, meaning that you want to, to have an environment that just doesn't change through time. So, and this is, for example, typically what I do at work. I have a, a I have a, an environment that is defined in a way, and it doesn't change until I explicitly say so, or I explicitly want it to get updated. So. I know that as long as I'm working on that uh, environment, I don't have any issues with packages, updated, or whatever. Um, and an obvious question that one might ask is, well, if I have the original script and the original data, what is the problem? Can I can I not get all of this, uh, all of these questions here, all of these points here answered for free? And the answer is no, uh, unfortunately. Because there are four things or four main things that can influence the uh, analysis or the results of an analysis. First of all, the version of R itself. So R is a pretty stable language. So usually it's not really R itself that is the issue, uh, but it can happen. Uh, it's mostly the packages. So if you update packages, and I'm pretty sure that this happened to most of you, if not all of you, you update the packages and some script doesn't work anymore. 
maybe or maybe it works and the results are different, which I think is even worse, right? At least if it fails, you know, okay, there's something wrong, but if it still succeeds, but the results are different, you might take even more time to notice. Um, the operating system as well can have an impact on the results. So the, uh, this is a bit more rare, but it happens. Um, in the book, actually, I, I document a case like that where they use the exact same script, exact same programming language and so on, but the result is different on Windows than on Linux than on Mac, which is really a problem as well. And the hardware as well can have an impact, but this is even rarer. So don't worry too much about the hardware, but it can happen in very weird circumstances. The, the hardware itself can have an impact. So this means that reproducibility is kind of on a spectrum. Okay, so you could, for example, uh, just have a publication, right, or the results of an analysis, and that's not reproducible at all. Well, some would argue that it is because, you know, you can read the paper and you can re-implement everything, but I don't really agree. Uh, but if you add the code to that, that's already better. If you add the code and the data, that's even better. And uh, if you add what uh, the uh, Roger Peng here called linked and executable code, then it's even better. In our context, linked and executable code, uh, it, imagine it's kind of the environment, the development environment. Um, so it can be like a Docker image or it can be something else, but basically the computational environment that would allow someone to run the code, all right? And if you have all of that, then you know your analysis is fully reproducible. Now, basically the huge problem is that uh, when you do an analysis or when someone does that analysis, usually just works on their machine, right? So that is a bit of an issue uh, because you are not going to be uh, sending the machine, right? To, to clients or to, to readers of your analysis. But actually that's exactly what we're going to do. We're not going to, to send be sending laptops around, but we are going to use Docker. We're going to use Nix. We're going to use RNV to essentially provide alongside the analysis to provide, yeah, the computational environment that people will need to, to run the code. So let's start with a project. So uh, my pet project for this is the uh, housing situation in Luxembourg. So like in many countries, it's not just in Luxembourg, but the housing situation is pretty bad. And so I got some data uh, from uh, some open data about uh, housing prices. And what is nice about this data is that it's also historical. So let me just uh, show you very quickly. So everything that I show you is uh, in this GitHub repository that I prepared for this talk. So you can you know, clone the repo, or if you don't use GitHub, you can just click here and download the zip and you have all the scripts, right? Uh, and if you go into the data folder, you have uh, this Excel file. So let me just show you how it looks like. Uh, this is how, what it looks like. So this Excel file, Maybe I can zoom in a bit. Uh, this Excel file contains uh, prices. Each sheet of the Excel file is a year. So that's really a typical you know, a way of, of presenting data. You have uh, sheets, and each sheet is a year. And then you have some, uh, you know, some human readable uh, header that explains what is going on. And then you have the prices. Now, this Excel file is not too bad, because if you skip the, the, the initial rows, you basically have a table. So it's okay-ish, but it still needs to be cleaned, right? And so that's what we're going to do. So let's suppose that uh, I have this script. And again, this is all from this is all from the GitHub repository, right? Um, I have two scripts, one to save the data and to kind of prepare it and clean it, and another to analyze the data. So if I look at save the data, uh, you see that I download, I download it from GitHub. Uh, maybe let me zoom in a little bit. Maybe it will make reading a bit easier. So I download it, and then I, I won't go into the details, but I start essentially cleaning it, right? Uh, I write one function just to add the year to uh, the table because, yeah, the, the year, as you see, is it's in the sheet name. It's not a column, and this is not good. And then I, I, again, I won't go into details. This is explained in detail in the book, but essentially this is a script that prepares data 
downloads it and makes it you know ready for analysis, right? And I, I do some testing. I, I look at some um, at some spelling because sometimes Luxembourg, so Luxembourg is the capital city of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. So sometimes it's Luxembourg, sometimes it's written Luxembourg City, sometimes something else. Piton, that's a city here. Sometimes it's written with an E, sometimes it's written with an E accent aigu. I won't go into French uh, grammar now, but yeah, that's a bit of the of some cleaning, some usual stuff, right? And then I, at the end, I save uh, and I do some tests as well, just very quickly. Uh, this is important as well. I do some tests where I, I see if I have all the communes in my data. So I download the the, the, com the data and a commune, right, is this thing. This is a, it's basically uh, a region. Uh, well, not quite a region. It's a bit uh, because Luxembourg is so small. We don't, I mean, don't really have regions. We have three uh, levels. We have the country, we have the canton, like in Switzerland, and within the cantons, we have communes. And usually a commune overlaps with the city. But not always. So, for example, the the commune of Luxembourg is essentially also the city of Luxembourg here. But it's also so we have the city of Luxembourg that is inside the commune of Luxembourg, which is like the the same. And then you have the uh, canton of Luxembourg, and finally you have the country of Luxembourg. So, yeah, you don't you don't get confused. But anyways, I'm doing these tests to check if I have everything. And I'm using even data from Wikipedia that contains lists of the communes to check if I have everything. Anyway, uh, I check some spelling again. And then I save I save the data into a nice, tidy CSV file. OK, so this is ready for analysis. And then I do my analysis. Uh, and here, it's a, you know, very simple stuff. I load my data. Uh, I do some transformation. Uh, in the data, I, I prepare the prices. Um, so these are these are of course uh, average average housing prices uh, of the of the houses, and these are average prices uh, by square meter. And so I, I do some I do some uh, some transformation on that uh, because of uh, inflation. I try to to deal with that and so on. But anyways, at the end, what what's important is that I do right at the end i do some plots that's it so i want you know to do some plots for certain communes and i save that as pdfs and that's it that's my analysis quite simple uh you know conceptually it's just doing some plots but uh, in practice i mean it's still quite a lot of code right i, I still need to to write uh, almost 300 lines of code to uh to get my analysis ready so I'm happy. I did my graphs. I'm happy, right? So let me go back to my, my slides. So I do, I did my analysis. Uh, let me just zoom. Yeah, I did my analysis and I have the script. So one to scrape the data, as I said, and prepare it and another to analyze it. Now, the question is what's wrong with these scripts? Why, why is that not okay? Well, in essence, nothing's really too wrong. I mean, you can use that. Uh, and you can work with that, and that's fine. You have your results. That's great. And that's the most important. However, it could be a bit better. It could be re more reproducible. Because here you have an issue. First of all, these are your workflow, so to speak, is a script-based workflow. So you have two scripts that you essentially need to run manually. So you need to run certain steps, and, and you need to know in what order to run the scripts and you need to be familiar with them. This is very simple because it's just two small scripts, but if you have a very big analysis with tens of thousands, uh, tens of thousands, not, but uh, like tw dozens of scripts and dozens of data sets, it can get very tricky very quickly. The other issue that you, you have is that uh, it's just a long series of calls, right? Uh, there are almost no functions. I wrote one or two. Uh, so it's difficult to reuse, it's difficult to test, it's difficult to parallelize, uh, and there's a lot of repetition at the end, the plots, right? I, I, I basically, uh, if I show that again, I basically write five times the same line. So there can be very easily uh, mistakes. For example, if I copy this line and I forget to change, uh, now uh, I'm overwriting my plot from before, and so on and so on. So this is not ideal. Um, this is not ideal. So we can make we can make it better, okay? And the other issue is that this is not reproducible, right? Because the issue 
here is that I, I don't really have any any file here that explains to me how to run that. I, I don't know which versions of these packages I need. It's it's written nowhere. I know I need these packages, but I know which versions. I don't know which version of R was used. Actually, I'm I'm doing something wrong because I'm doing this on R, the, the latest R, 4.4 over here. But I wrote this script almost two years ago now. And so this was an older version of R, and these are the packages that are loaded, right? And these are not the same packages that I used at the time. All right, so I'm doing this on a more recent version. Here it is. I'm doing this on a more recent version of R than what was done at the time. Now, I'm lucky. Uh, in my case, it didn't change anything, but who knows, right? I mean, in your case, maybe it will, and or in more complex uh, cases, maybe, maybe it will. And I have no guarantee that this will keep working in five years or in two years or even in six months. Who knows? So this is a bit of the issue that we are facing right now. All right. Uh, let me go back. Uh, and yeah, and another another thing is that usually what we want at the end is some kind of, of I call them like data products. Uh, we want uh, a report or we want uh, maybe a clean data set or maybe we want, uh, I don't know, a, a, a trained model that we want to deploy behind an API, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we rarely just want a script. We usually we want something else. So basically we're not really done yet. We have these this, uh, PDFs with these images, these plots, but we actually, we don't just want the plots. Usually we want to integrate them into an analysis. So it would be bad that we essentially do something where we do all these steps at once. Uh, yeah, and as I said, there is no record of package R versions used. So this is not uh, the best. So to turn our script to producible, basically we should be answering these questions. So how, how easy would it be for someone else to rerun the analysis? Um, how easy would it be to update the project, maybe with new data, uh, and how risky as well? How easy would it be to reuse this code for another project? And finally, uh, what guarantee do we have that the output is stable through time? If we can answer all of that, then with, with uh, satisfactory answers, let's say, then uh, we're pretty safe. So first of all, let me start by the, the easiest thing that really you should be doing. It's the cheapest, so to speak, in terms of time. The easiest is really you know just use RNV to generate an RNV log file. That's really the, the, the most basic thing. Uh, once you're done with your analysis, you just open an R session that contains the scripts, right? And you just run R and in it. Uh, let me try. I don't know. I, when you try things live, never works, but let's see. So this is where I have my scripts. So let me just set that as the working directory. And let's try. So I, I have R and in it. I just run R and in it. And I answer yes. And let's see if it's going to work. So it did some stuff, uh, and it produced this RN uh, this RN folder, and it should also have yeah, and it produced this RN log file. Okay, so now before I just had this and this, and now I have this uh, R profile RN and RN log file. And if I look at the log file now, it it has recorded the version of R. And it recorded all of the packages that were needed to run this analysis with exact versions. So for example, this package, that's this version. Okay, this package, that's this version. And it also tells me where I got it from, from CRAN. Okay, this one came from CRAN. If it was a GitHub package, it would be listed that it came from GitHub. If it was from Bioconductor, it would be listed that it was from Bioconductor. So this is the thing that if you at least do that, people that want to reproduce your study and maybe even future you they have this file and they can use this file to restore the packages okay so if you do uh, rnv uh, restore yeah rnv restore it will download the packages and it and it will make them available for this analysis this folder over here this rnv folder contains all the packages in the library folder okay here it is these are all the packages for this uh, for this analysis. So with RNV, you get 
a per project library. So each project gets a separate library that does not interfere with the other projects. So you can have at least this file that records what you used, and you can then also use that file to uh, restore the state of the packages. What is also important to, to realize though, is that RNV records the version of R, but will not restore it. So when you run R and restore, it will not install the, this version of R. So that's a bit of an, of an issue uh, because ideally you would want both, okay? But at least you have the packages. And as you saw, it's very simple. Just run R and init when you're done and uh, you know help future you and help uh, replicators and so on. At least there's this file. Of course, what you can also do, and that's even better, is don't you, don't just use R and at the end. Use R and at the beginning, and work with a per project uh, library of packages. So you can use it as you work on your project. You use R and and then you have, you have a library for project A. You have a library for project B, and so on. Okay, good. Um, let me just yeah. So this is basically what I told you. Uh, yeah, if you want to restore uh, an analysis, for example, what you can do, uh, I have here a little example. If you go to R and restore, and if I run here, uh, set working directory, I have this thing here. Maybe I need to actually, I, it's better to restart the R session to make sure that everything is all right. Uh, set as working directory. If you run, I won't do it now because it takes some time, but yeah, if you run R and restore, uh, it will ask you, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to activate? And I and and yeah, I want to activate it. And then it's going to to start downloading stuff uh, and so on. But yeah, I'm not going to to do it now. Um, let's see. Yeah, in this case, it's not working. I think I know why it's not working because actually, what you're seeing here, this R Studio and this R Session, this is uh, actually running from Nix. And so, you know, Nix, I guess, is interfering with R and Via because R and usually will use your system R and not the Nix. But I will talk about that more later. What is important to understand, though, is that R and while I think it's pretty nice because it allows you uh, actually did something. Uh, actually, it did you see? There are, there's my packages now. Um, but R and while it works nicely. Sometimes it doesn't work, especially if you want to restore a very old log file on a different operating system. If, for example, the, the log file was generated on Mac and you want to restore it on Windows or on Linux or whatever, usually it might be a bit uh, difficult because our end will only restore our packages. But there's you know, the whole system that you need to deal with. For example, if you are doing uh, things like uh, you know, uh, geospatial analysis, Usually, there are things like GDAL that you need as well, uh, for example, or, or Geos and Terra and so on. So these are kind of system level libraries that you also need to deal with. So ideally, you would want to use RND with something else. So and this is where we're going to go now. So yeah, so that's basically what I said. It records, but does not restore the version of R. Uh, you, the installation of old packages, so if you want to restore an old R and log file can fail because of missing uh, OS level dependencies. But at least you have this file. It's basically free to generate. And it can really help you know, and be kind of a blueprint to dockerize a pipeline or to dockerize an analysis. Basically, what I mean by that is that if you have this R and log file, you can restore it inside of Docker. And usually, it's going to work a bit better <laughs> because you can use all the images, for example, if it's an old project. And then you can run your scripts and run your analysis inside that environment. And that's what we're going to do uh, now. Uh, so where are we? Packages and R versions are recorded. Packages can be restored, but not always. But where's the pipeline? So again, I'm not going to go into the details with targets. But essentially, what you would want to do is also to have this pipeline or this analysis as a targets pipeline. Actually, let me show you. I should have it here now uh, let me just find it i think yeah yeah essentially what you have yeah if you transform your analysis 
as a as a targets pipeline, it will look like this. So you start with targets, and then you you continue and you list different targets. And each target is the output of a function. So for example, the commune level data is the output of this function that reads in the data, right? Uh, this uh, data here is the output of this function. And it uses as input this, right? So, and so you can chain all of your all of your analysis together into this pipeline. And at the end, you can even compile an RMD or a Quarto document. And what is interesting with this approach is that targets will keep track for you of everything that you do. So for example, if I change this function, okay, targets will only rerun the, the here, will only recompute the objects that were impacted by it. So if I change this function, this one is going to be recomputed and this one is going to be recomputed, but not this one, because this one has nothing to do with this function. So this one is going to get recomputed, this one is going to get recomputed, and then because I changed this, the analysis is going to get recomputed as well. So targets keeps track of this for you. You don't you won't be rerunning everything. Now, unfortunately, I cannot go into more details, but again, uh, I highly uh, recommend that you take a look at targets and that you that you read the documentation. They have on their website like a four minute video that explains everything in four minutes and, and you just know how it works. So I highly recommend that you take a look at it. Okay, so before going to Docker, uh, does anyone have a question perhaps that I could answer uh, regarding what I just talked about now? Uh, no questions, I can continue. Okay, I don't think I see. Uh, again, question. the question in the chat, I just unmute them all. I don't know if you want to ask questions directly, any of you, or put the questions in the chat and we we'll read them too. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue uh, in this case then. Um, okay, good. So let's move to Docker. So again, let me just repeat. So RNV deals with uh, R package versions, but if you restore uh, a package library, maybe some installation will fail because maybe some packages need dependencies from your system. So typically, if you're doing geospatial analysis, you will need something like GDAL or PROJ. These are, these are libraries that are they are not our libraries but they are libraries that have something to do with your uh, operating system I, I see someone posted the the link to the uh, to the to the video great thank you um and so ideally we would need to deal with that as well and we would also we also need to deal with the r version as well uh, and this is where docker will help us okay so let's take a look uh, at docker so Using Docker, we will be able essentially to ship uh, a computer, so to speak. So Docker, you know, a lot of people uh, think of, of Docker as kind of a virtual machine thing, and uh, it's not totally wrong. Uh, so I think this is a good, you know, mental model to, to just think of Docker images as virtual machines. Uh, it, but technically it's not really that, but honestly, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what I like to think about is that Docker is it's essentially virtual machines that you can interact with. Uh, you can interact with them programmatically, meaning you can program and script how they should work. Whereas if you use a virtual machine like with a, you know, a virtual box or whatever, then you, you really have to interact with it if, if it were a computer, you have to log in and so on and so forth, which is not great uh, if you just want to run an, an analysis quickly. Uh, so what is Docker? So it's a containerization tool. So it's not, again, virtual machines, but okay, close enough, let's say. Uh, so it's something that you install on your computer and it allows you to build images. And from these images, you run containers. So a container is an instance of an image, okay? So an image is not like a, an image that you see on your screen, but they call it Docker images for some reason. 
So Docker images contain all the software and the code you need for a particular project. And by software here, I mean really software, not just R packages. It's R, it's R packages. It's, you know, LaTeX packages if you need to write a paper, Quarto, it's uh, whatever. It can be anything. It can be also Python if you need it, uh, everything. They are immutable. So Docker images, you cannot change the image at runtime. Okay, you can add stuff to a running container, but once you turn off the container, this is not written in the image. The image cannot be changed. So to, to change an image, you really need to rebuild it, okay? And you can share an image online and offline. So there's a Docker, so the so-called Docker registry called RHub, and it's basically a repository of Docker images. You can use it to get images from there and to share images as well, but you can also share them offline. You just save them on, on, a, on a hard drive or, and, or a USB thumb, and you can share them uh, without any issues. <laughs> so a little word of warning. So uh, this is not quite up to date yet because there were some updates to Docker. I wrote there at the time that it works best on Linux and Mac OS. Uh, if you use on Windows with WSL, especially with WSL2, now it's kind of okay. Uh, it's basically running on Linux inside uh, Windows, so it's fine. Uh, but you need to enable WSL on Windows. So you need to have, uh, I mean, you need, I think you don't need to, strictly speaking, but it's much better if you have WSL2 running as well. So WSL2 is something that you need to, to activate on your Windows, and it basically installs a Linux runtime on your Windows. Uh, so I will try to make this entry as gentle as possible, but it's not a super easy topic. If it's really the very first time you've been confronted to these ideas, it can be, a, you know, be a bit confusing. Again, don't hesitate to, you know, just ask some questions now or or afterwards once you've digested it. Uh, no problem. I, I can help you to get started. So let's start with an hello Docker uh, file. So I have here uh, prepared a little something. So if I go over here, where's my mouse? Yeah, uh, here, hello Docker. So I have this Docker file. So a Docker file is basically a recipe that you write, okay? And inside of that recipe, you, you basically say what you want. So I want to start from Ubuntu. So Ubuntu is a Linux distribution. So all, not all, but all, basically all Docker images that you are going to use are based on Linux. Uh, it's very rare to use uh, Mac or, or Windows images. So you're going to be using Linux images and then you can run some stuff on it. And of course, if you are familiar with Linux, it really helps because it is Linux essentially. Uh, but if you are not, uh, there are a lot of different recipes that you can use and you just need to change a little bit and then it's going to work or you can get some help. But in this case, this, this Docker file is just saying, well, I want to use Ubuntu and I want this, uh, you know, container. When I run the container, I want it to tell me hello, hello from Docker. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to open. Yeah, this is the. Actually, I can go here. I think. Uh, no, I let me open a terminal. So I will go to a terminal. So if you are using a uh, Mac, it'll be your Mac terminal. If you are using uh, Windows. Uh, you can use the uh, you know PowerShell or uh, or uh, some or uh, yeah the command line as well. So you you have to use the terminal for this. Um, so let's see where I am. Yeah, so scripts Docker and hello. Yeah, so I have my Docker file here. So I'm in the right folder. I have my Docker file and my Docker file just says hello, you know hello from from Docker. Uh, where is my mouse? Yeah, here it is. Hello from Docker. That's what it says. Very simple. So first of all, I'm going to build the image. So to build the image, you can run Docker build. Uh, I had some stuff before. Yeah. So I'm going to run Docker build minus T hello. So minus T is I'm tagging the image. I'm giving it a name. And the dot is just to say that the Docker file is in this folder. <laughs> so now it's going to go very quickly uh, because not much is happening and I already built that uh, this morning. So uh, of course it's it's working, it's cached. As you see, it's using over here the cache. So now my image is built, but nothing happened. I just built the image. So now I can use it by running a container. And to run a container, I'm going to run Docker run, and I just need to find, yeah. So 
what, what am I going to do? I'm going to run Docker run. I'm going to add the option RM. So this is just to say, once my container is done running, remove it. If you don't do that, the container just lingers in the background. It just keeps running. This is, of course, useful if you want to run a server, for example, a shiny server. You want it to be running. Uh, but in my case, I just want it to be uh, deleted. I'm going to uh, give a name to this container. I'm going to call it hello container. OK, uh, I could call it whatever. And I'm going to say it, it should be a container from the hello image. So remember that before I called my image, I called it hello. OK, so that's the name of the image. And now I want to run a container that is going to call, be called hello container. And it should be an instance of the hello image. So let's run that. And as you see, I got an hello from Docker. So this hello here came from Ubuntu, from inside of that Docker. It's not coming from my computer. Uh, it's not coming from my uh, operating system. It's coming from this Docker. And basically, what we are going to do is we are going to exploit this here to run anything that we want. Uh, you can run a Shiny server. You can run an RStudio uh, server. You can just run a script. Just you can just run R script uh, source this and that. You can run a targets pipeline, etc., etc., etc. You can really run anything. So it's very powerful. So um, let me just see if I forgot something. Yeah. So a Docker file is basically a recipe for an image. So to build the image, you run this, and to run the container, you run this. So everything should be in the slides. Uh, yes. So this is basically to explain to you, uh, if I have here, for example, this analysis over here, okay, uh, my pipe, my source code of the pipeline, if I run it on an operating system X with this version of R, I get this output, okay, this star with, with seven uh, heads. But if I run the same pipeline in a future version of R, maybe R 4.1.3 or whatever, in a different operating system, my output might be slightly different. It might be almost the same, but it might be different. And it might be different enough that I care about it. This is without Docker. But with Docker, it doesn't matter. Because with Docker, I'm running basically this capsule, okay, this container, right? <laughs> and my analysis is running actually inside of that container. So my version of R here that I have, R 4.5.1.3, whatever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't interact at all because my script is running inside of that container and that container is this version of Ubuntu and this version of R uh, with exact packages and exact uh, you know, dependencies. So it's always going to be the same result. Okay, so how do you dockerize a project now? OK, so how do you go from hello to actually running an analysis? So the idea is to say, well, uh, let me just, the idea is to say that when you build the image, you install R, or you use an image that already contains the correct version of R. And I will explain to you what that means. Then you install the packages, for example, using the R and vlog file from before. This is one possibility, uh, but you could use another. I will explain that as well. Then you copy all the scripts to the image. You run the analysis. So in this case, uh, it's a targets pipeline. But you know, if it's a script, you could just source the script. Or you know, if it's something else that you have, maybe a make file, you can just run your make file, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Doesn't matter. And then when you run the container. What you will do is you will just copy the outputs from the analysis from the container to your computer. Because whatever happens in your container stays in your container unless you explicitly change that. So if you run an analysis that produces uh, uh, some plots, for example, these plots are going to stay inside of the container unless you get them back by explicitly uh, doing that. So you have to do that explicit, OK? Um, yeah, so you can share the image, or you can just share the Docker file, OK? So user scanner rebuilds the image. 
And the outputs will always stay the same if you use RNV, if you use an image that ships with the exact version of R. And basically at build time or build time versus runtime. So again, build time builds the image, meaning software packages and dependencies get installed using run statements. And you must ensure that everything gets installed correctly and that there is no difference between today and in two years. And I will explain what I mean by that. And at runtime, the last command where we you have CMD gets executed. Okay, so let me just show you. Uh, so I think I saw, first of all, I think I saw a question fly by the screen. Let me just, yeah. So dockerizing a project is building an image of a project. Yeah, in a, in a way, exactly. So essentially what you're going to do is you're going to build an image uh, that contains all the software, that contains the scripts, that contains whatever you need to rerun it. Uh, what you are aiming at is that someone that runs Docker run and your image should get the result without doing anything else. Okay, so that's what you what you are aiming at. And yeah, as uh, Johannes mentions, uh, on Windows you have Docker Desktop. Uh, I I have it actually on my on my work laptop, but I I personally don't use it, so I don't I don't even know how you build. Um, the images in Docker Desktop, but I guess there's some some interface that you can use. Uh, the reason I don't use the interface is that because usually I also have to work from uh, from servers, or I have to, or or I work from uh, GitHub Actions or from GitLab uh, CI, and uh, and the issue is that there's no GUI there, so I, I use the terminal. But yeah, Docker Docker Desktop should should make it easier uh, if you're starting out, definitely. So let's see an example. So here I have a dockerized project. So basically what I what I have here, let me just set this as the working directory. Basically I have this uh, targets analysis. It's basically the same as the one from before. Uh, it's, you know, uh, sourcing some functions. Uh, it's, you know, sourcing some data. So basically this targets here is the pipeline equivalent of what I showed you before. So before we had these two scripts, save and analyze this targets pipeline does everything as a pipeline okay and so basically it uh, it uh, you know gets the communes uh, it runs some tests it prepares the data uh, and it you know and it outputs uh, it this uh, file this rmd and if i look at the rmd file what it's doing is that it's loading the data that was prepared before using tar load so tar load is a function from targets um to basically get the data is kind of a read if you want, like a read CSV if you want. And then it's just plotting the graphs, okay? I won't go into detail, uh, but basically uh, I also put here session info just to prove that this was running inside of Docker. So I want to, I have an RNV log file as well. You see, uh, this was done on version 4.3.1. So I have this version. Uh, I have uh, these uh, functions that I'm going to use. So now my code is uh, nice functions that are uh, documented uh, and tested and so on. And finally, the Docker file. And so the Docker file will look complicated, but don't worry. First of all, instead of starting from Ubuntu, I start from this Docker image. And this Docker image is basically provided by the Rocker project. So the Rocker project is a collection, is a project that, that handles and manages a collection of Docker images made for R. So you have R with different versions directly available. So in this case, I have a version of R or, or a Docker image with R 4.3.0. Then I install a lot of stuff, okay? This is These are system level dependencies, okay? If you are not familiar with Linux, this looks very complicated. Don't worry. If you need a Docker image to run an analysis, just copy this. Just take this as an example. Just copy it. Uh, I can show you as well where I got this. Uh, maybe I can show you now, actually. Let me show you now. Perhaps that will be make things a bit clearer. But basically, first of all, let me uh, show you Rocker project. So if you go on the Rocker project, uh, the, it's uh, uh, this project over here, this website. They explain to you how you can use their Docker images that come, you know, with uh, with uh, with our studio, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also over here, uh, the versions 
uh, images. These are the ones that interest us. So divergent image, uh, images, they, they have like R4.0, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have R4.4.1 and so on and so forth. So that's, a f so that's the first thing, so, okay? So that's where I got them. And if you go actually on Docker Hub, you can see uh, also the images there, right? You can see them over here. We have uh, development versions. We have uh, uh, 4, 4.4, 4.4.1. You, know, you can go to a, you know, all the level of details. And of course, you can go to all the versions. Uh, you can go to you know, 4.0, 4.2, and so on and so forth. Uh, with CUDA as well, uh, if you need CUDA, so uh, GPU acceleration, for example, that's really neat. Everything is pre-configured. You just you know, pull, and that's it. So basically, if you want to use this image, you go uh, over here and you write, you know, our version 4.0.0, et cetera, et cetera, and you get that version. Now, where did I get all of this? Now, this is uh, something that I don't know is very uh, well known, but basically, Posit has now, um, uh, they, they now have like a, a, a package repository, uh, which I think is over here. Yeah. And so they, you know, basically it's like CRAN uh, in, a, in a mirror of CRAN, if you want. So if you type, for example, dplyr or whatever, you type dplyr and they explain to you, okay, there's dplyr, there's all of this. And if you click, you they explain how to install it and so on and so forth. And, and they say, okay, uh, you know, here are the system prerequisites, but I don't see anything, okay? So they say, select a distribution above. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to setup and I'm going to say, well, uh, you know, I, I want uh, for Ubuntu, okay? So for the latest Ubuntu, for example, okay? I'm going to go for the latest Ubuntu. And now you have all the requirements here. They are all listed. This is basically exactly what is there and by package. So I could check if the dplyr has some, I don't think dplyr has, uh, but I don't know if I want to install, uh, let's try to find something that is perhaps uh well known well uh, yeah whatever i mean if i need to install this package deforestable i can i need to add this to my docker image that's it basically uh and so this is what i did uh, essentially uh and and that's why i say you can just copy this because this should cover uh, your needs so this is really the setup <laughs> Then, as you see, I run install rnf. So I install the rnf package. I make some directories. These are the directories that are going to hold my, my, my project. I copy the log file inside. So this takes it from my computer inside of the Docker image. I copy my functions. I copy my RMD. I copy my targets script. And then inside of the Docker image, as you see, I ran rn restore to basically install all of the packages there. And then I run tarmake. And tarmake basically runs my pipeline. Again, if I have a script, I can here run source my script, etc. So this, all these run commands, all of this, this will run when I build the image. But the very last one, this one, this is going to run when I run a container, okay? When I execute a container, it's going to run this. And what this is going to do, it's going to move, MV is move, it's going to move the outputs from my Docker image, okay? To my shared folder. And the shared folder is a folder that I have between my computer and Docker. So basically, the input is going to appear uh, there. So the output, sorry, the output of my of my pipeline is going to appear there. So let me show you. Um, as you see, my Dockerized project, I have nothing here. I mean, I don't have the shared folder here yet, okay? So let me build the image. Let me just go to the right folder. So I'm in the right folder. Now let me build. So I need to build a Docker build and I need to find, yeah. So I'm going to build my housing image because it's the project about housing. 
uh, it's run very quickly because everything is cached already, as you can see, because I, I built it this morning, so everything is cached. Uh, but as you see, you know, everything was done. So great. Now I can run my container. Uh, and the container, again, remember, it's just going to copy the output to my computer. Again, if I look at the folder structure, you see I, I don't have my shared folder over here. I don't have my shared folder. I only have my inputs. Now let's run my analysis. So let's find, OK, so this is very complex. Let me just run it, and then I explain. So I run. It's done. Let's take a look again at the folder structure. Now all of a sudden, I have this folder that appeared, shared folder. This folder here is the shared folder between my Docker image and my computer. And as you look by the, as you can see from the timestamp, it was done just now. So let's go into shared folder and let's see what I have there. I have this HTML file. So this is basically the output of my analysis from before. And now let me just run it uh, or let me show it to you. Let's open it in my web browser. And there it is. So this was done today. These are the plots that I done be, that I ran before. And here is the session info. This ran inside of Docker with this version of R from 2023 on this version of Ubuntu, which by the way is not, uh, I, I'm not I'm using Linux here, but I'm not using Ubuntu, I'm using another Linux. So it's not even the same Linux. Um, and with these versions of packages. And if I run this in five years, it's going to be the same stuff. Um, so this is pretty useful. It's a bit complex because you have you no know, build and then run and whatever, but it's, it's very useful. Now, let me just go back to the command to run it. It was very big and a bit complex. Let me just explain. So Docker run, same as before. RM to remove the container once I'm done. I give it a name. I call it housing container. OK. And now I have this V here. What is that? Basically, all of this here that I highlight, this is my shared folder. This V means volume. I'm mounting a volume, meaning I'm, I'm you know, creating a, a shared folder, if you want. And this shared folder goes from my computer. Where is my mouse? I don't see my mouse. It goes from my computer. Yeah, here it is. Goes from my computer. This is my computer. This is on my computer, this part here. So it goes from my computer inside of the Docker, which is this part here, OK? Housing shared folder. This is inside of the Docker. And if you look at my Docker file here, you see this is where I put my outputs at the end. It's housing shared folder. And this housing shared folder now, if you want, I connect with this folder here on my computer and I give it uh, access. So RV is read and write, so read and write access. And again, I need to specify the image. It's from this image called housing image. Okay, and so when I run this, it's going to just you know move the outputs to my computer because all of the analysis happened before when I run this. This is where the analysis run. It could be much more complex. Uh, it could be something that uh, trains a model, for example. It could be something uh, that, uh, I don't know, runs uh, whatever you want. Uh, but, uh, but it just happens there. And now I just you know, uh, get and, and fish, so to speak, the output of my analysis. You can also. Instead of you know doing something like that, you can say that you want, for example, to run the analysis whenever you run the container. You could do that as well. Uh, but the problem with that is that uh, then you, you also still need to deal with the shared folder. So it's not like it makes that easier. And uh, you, you need to wait uh, when you build. And then you need to wait when you run the container. Whereas if you do everything at build time, then you no, know, it's just running at build time. Then you don't care, right? Uh, and then once you run the container, it happens uh, instantly. Okay, so I think that I can. Yeah, I talked a bit about the Rocker project. 
yeah, so they have images with Shiny as well. So you can run Shiny servers, Shiny apps from Docker. So basically, you have your Shiny app inside of Docker and Shiny server, and you can run that, uh, you know, from from uh, from from Docker. Uh, so yeah, you are using yeah Docker Hub. This is where the images get downloaded from. It's what I I showed you here. Uh, let me just go back to Docker Hub. Yeah, here it is. So Docker Hub is where all the images are stored. So when you when you run, you know, from Ubuntu or from this or whatever, uh, the images get pulled from here. Uh, let me just continue. Yeah, you can also, you know, share your images as well. And yeah, this is basically what I what I showed you. Yeah, this we discussed. And yeah, this is the, the, the project. This is everything that I discussed as well with the code explained to run. Okay, so Docker, is it a panacea? Well, it's very widely used. It's very popular. There is a high entry cost because as I as I showed you, you know, you need to be familiar a bit with with Docker itself before be able to, to to use it, but there are many resources to get you started. Um, the issue as well is that there's it's basically a single point of failure, right? What if you know Docker gets abandoned or bought or whatever or it doesn't really run anymore or you never know. And actually, in a way, Docker doesn't really allow you to deal with reproducibility as such, but we are kind of abusing Docker, right? Because we are using our end, uh, we are using these different tools to make our pipeline reproducible, but it's not that Docker by itself makes your pipeline reproducible, okay? Because if you don't use our end, right, each time you are going to build the image and you just do install packages, blah, 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 and you don't use our end, each time you're going to build the image, it's going to download the latest packages. So Docker itself is no guarantee. Right, you need still to use R and or something else that you can use. Let me just show you. If we go back to the package manager from uh, from from Posit, right? Uh, if you go here and if you go, let me maybe show you from the start. If you go, so this is the the main page. If you then go on setup, right? And if you say, well, I'm on Mac, I'm on Linux, whatever. But if you are using inside of Docker, you're on Linux. You say that you are on Ubuntu if you are using Ubuntu. What you can do is you can enable here the snapshots. So you can say, yes, always install the packages from the date I choose. And you can say, I want my packages to come from the 1st of July. And this is going to be a snapshot of CRAN from the 1st of July. And so then they tell you how to configure it. They say, well, use this URL here. Use this as the CRAN URL. And they, they explain to you how to do it with screenshots, right? Uh, and if you are using, you know, R outside of R Studio, this is basically what you are doing uh, inside of Docker. They say, well, you need to run this code. Okay, so you run this code, you put it in your R profile, and then every time you're going to write install packages, it's going to download them as they were on the 1st of July. So this is a way to use this to, to basically have reproducible packages without RN. So you don't necessarily need RN, but then you need this, okay? <laughs> uh, maybe some of you know about MRAN, the Microsoft uh, CRAN mirror that is now doesn't exist anymore. At the time, several years ago, they did this, they provided these daily snapshots um, of, of CRAN. Uh, now they don't do it anymore, but, but pose it uh, does. So this is a way if you don't want to use R and you could use this, but you still need to do that. You still need to have, you know, Docker with a specific image uh, or a specific version of R, and then you need uh, this thing, or you need R and, or you need something else, right? And so, in a way, we are kind of abusing Docker because Docker by itself is not really a tool for reproducibility. It's just a very handy tool that allows you to uh, Dockerize analysis, and if you are uh, clever, you can make it. Uh, or you can use it to make your analysis reproducible, but as such, it's not a tool for reproducibility. And uh, this is where Nix uh, comes uh, into play. But before that, maybe I will uh, check if we have some questions. Um, so 
uh, you can create a Docker, but can you modify, add new data? Can you modify or add another analysis? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, so what I do at work, uh, for example, is I create a Docker image that contains what I need in terms of packages, right? So I, I put my R version in there. I put the usual packages that I use, and I save this image like this without running any analysis. And then for another analysis, instead, basically what I do is that instead of, uh, I, I, I start a new Docker image, and instead of writing here from this, I write from my image that already contains the right version of R, that already contains the right version of my packages and so on. And so I, I build a new image that starts from this other image that contains everything. And then I add my scripts and I add my data and I add my stuff and I run my analysis. Another thing that you can do if you have, for example, confidential data, usually it's not a very good idea to put your confidential data inside of Docker images. What you can also do is that you can, just as I did before with a volume to get back data from Docker, you can use a volume or a shared folder to provide data to a running container. So what you can do is that you don't put the data inside of the Docker image, you leave it on your computer or on your network or on an S3 or whatever. And then at container runtime, you just provide the data and the analysis runs and you get back, you get back the results. So this is also something that you can do. So it's very flexible. Um, and in the book, actually, I explain uh, how you can do that, how you can uh, you know, start by building a, a, a basis, so to speak, Docker image that contains Docker, uh, that contains R, R packages and so on, and then uh, you use that image as a as a stepping stone for your analysis. So you can you know do uh, something like that. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, do we have other questions? No worries. Yeah, I mean, if you have questions, don't don't hesitate to write, and then I. Uh, I hear my voice. I have some echoes. Oh, sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Do we have someone who wants to ask a question or? OK. I mean, don't don't hesitate or uh, raise your hand or write in the chat, and then I'll take some time. Uh, I think I can go to the next topic then. And then, yeah, at the end, we can. Uh, yeah, Nix, the Nix package manager. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Nix and then we should have a bit of time left to also answer some questions. So what is the Nix package manager? So Nix is um, a package manager, but not only a package manager, it's actually many things. It's a package manager, it's a programming language, it's an operating system, it's many things. We are focusing on the package manager. And what is a package manager? So a package manager is a tool to manage and install packages. But in this case, we are not talking about our packages. Uh, so here the, the, the word packages comes from, let's say the Linux, the Linux meaning of a package, which is basically any piece of software. So uh, for example, in the context here of the Nix package manager, R is itself a package. Firefox, you could install Firefox with Nix, is itself a package and so on. And you already know package managers. For example, you probably know this one, which is the Google Play Store. Or if you're using an iPhone, you are perhaps more familiar with the App Store. Those are, in a way, package managers. They allow you to install packages. In this case, they're mobile apps. But it's basically this idea of having a central program that downloads and uh, uninstalls and updates other software. <laughs> So Nix um, is a package manager that you can use uh, for to manage, you know, your 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 software, including R. So as I as I as I showed you before, you know, per project uh, development environments are not really a thing in R. Uh, it's not something that that people really do. Uh, in Python, it's the case. In Python, people really start an analysis by first setting up 
a project specific Python version and project specific Python packages. So there it's really kind of the, 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 the common practice to just, you know, you start your analysis and you immediately define an environment for that analysis. This is not really the case in R. Um, and so we have RN, as I, as I showed before, but RN just deals with R packages, it doesn't deal with R, doesn't deal with uh, system level dependencies like GDAL and things like that. Uh, so as I explained, a popular approach is Docker plus RN, uh, but the issue here is that you have to abuse Docker, right? You have to, to kind of bend Docker to make it reproducible. Nix is a, a package manager that focuses on reproducibility by design. So Nix is really focused on reproducibility. Uh, it's a package manager that was explicitly and specifically made for reproducibility, which means that with Nix, you can write a single file which contains a so-called Nix expression. And this Nix expression defines all the environment for you. It defines the R version, the R packages, uh, Python version, Python packages, if you want. It deals with all the dependencies of all the packages and with the dependencies of their dependencies and so on and so forth. Basically, this means that it doesn't matter where you run Nix, as long as you can install and run Nix, you will be very likely be able to uh, rebuild a development environment to run your analysis. I say very likely because there can be some differences due to operating systems, because there are, for example, there are some differences between Mac and, uh, and Linux. So sometimes something works on Linux and not on Mac, but most of the time it should be, it should be fine. Uh, and if it works on one, in one place, it works in another, which means as well that if it works uh, inside of, uh, of Docker, it doesn't even matter which basic image you are going to use, which base image. Doesn't matter if you are using Ubuntu or something else. Doesn't matter if it's an updated version of Ubuntu or an older version of Ubuntu. If you can install Nix on it, you are going to be able to restore exactly the same environment everywhere. So that's very useful. Um, so this is a Nix expression. So this is the expression. So basically, we had Docker files before. Now we have these Nix expressions. And this you know, also kind of looks complicated. But don't worry, you will not need to write these expressions yourself <laughs> because you are going to, uh, if, you, if you are interested, you are going to be uh, using the, the package that I wrote called Rix. And actually this was already shared in the chat I saw. So this package will generate these expressions for you, but I will of course demo it as well. So let me just quickly uh, explain. So this expression is written in the Nix language that I won't discuss. It defines a repository uh, that we are going to use with a fixed revision. I'm going to explain what that means. It lists all the packages to install. Uh, it defines the output. In our case, the output is going to be a development shell, but it could be something else. But in the cases that interest us, us it's a development shell. And uh, software for Nix is downloaded from a, a, a GitHub repository, actually, that contains tens of thousands of Nix expressions that, that are written by volunteers. Uh, I, I lend a hand to, to manage the uh, R uh, ecosystem in Nix. And so this is a completely you know, open source uh, project. And um, because it uses GitHub, you can actually use a specific commit for reproducibility purposes. But again, I'm going to explain that. Uh, so for example, if you use uh, this commit over here, this is going to install version this version of R and the associated packages with it, this commit over here. Again, you don't need to do that by hand, okay? We are going to be using Rix and Rix is going to do that for you, okay? But I just want to show you a bit into the in the details how, how it looks like in artworks. So uh, this is the, uh, the GitHub repository of Nix packages that contains all the different expressions. You don't need to interact with it if you don't want to. Uh, but if you are interested and want to make to help us make the R ecosystem better, uh, you can you know join and uh, and and reach out to me and I'll I'll introduce you. But in any case, this is where the software gets downloaded from. So when you are using Nix to install R 
and install our packages, you are not going to download the packages from CRAN anymore. You're going to download them from this GitHub Nix repository. So uh, yeah, system packages in my expression from before is a variable that lists all the software to install. So in this case, it's just R. So we're going just to install R. Then uh, we define a shell and this shell basically is going to take R as an input, okay, over here. So it will use R and when we start the shell, it's going to start R. Don't worry if you're not following everything. I'm going to explain, okay, I don't know what happened now. Uh, I'm going to explain to you, uh, what, you know, what this all means uh, in the demo. Yeah, uh, so yeah, writing this expression requires learning a new language, the Nix language. It's an extremely powerful language, uh, but if all we want is use it for our purposes of reproducibility, then the Rix package will help you. So Nix expressions can uh, be used to install software. Uh, you can also then use them to build per project development shells. These shells or these environments can include R, LaTeX, Quarto, Python, Julia, whatever you want. Uh, and Nix, again, will take care of installing absolutely everything, all dependencies of all the dependencies of all the dependencies. So basically, what I showed you before here in Docker, these things, Nix is going to do that for you. You are not going to list that. This is going to be included with Nix, basically. Uh, yeah, so just before I continue, so uh, in Nix, you have access to CRAN and Bioconductor packages. So there's more than 20,000 packages right now. Bioconductor has more than 2,000 packages. And almost all of them are available through uh, Nix. I say almost because there are some very bizarre packages that sometimes require proprietary software to run or sometimes require very specific configurations, and these are not going to work, but it's, I think, really a minority of packages. It's like 100 something packages that don't work. All the rest is basically working, or if not working, just open an issue and we help you make it work because we, we while we do strive to make everything work seamlessly, there's always one or other package that might slip through the cracks. So you can find the packages here. Basically, if you go uh, on this uh, website, the Nix search, you can, you know, you can um, type dplyr and then unstable, for example, or or the channel, whatever the release channel, and you can find, you know, even for Python here, dplyr and so on, and you can find, you know, the different packages, and this is how you would install them. Uh, but you are going to write a script to do that for us. Okay, I think now it's time for the demo. Yeah, so if, yeah, the demo. So the demo for the demo, we are going to use Rix. So Rix basically is an R package with a single function. Well, not a single function, but the main function is Rix. And basically, you say, I want this version of R. I want these packages. I want R Studio. I want this. I want that. And it's going to build the Nix expression for you. Okay, so I I'm going to show you in the demo. It will make it clearer. Uh, so you can list what you need, and you can list an, an IDE, uh, and it's going to create an environment for you that you can use to work interactively. Uh, yeah, you can build then the expression you Nix build. Basically, before we had Docker build, now you have Nix build, right? And then when you want to use the environment, you use a Nix shell. Basically, before we had Docker run, now it's Nix shell, and now you can you know run. And you can even generate these Nix expressions without having Nix installed. So even if you don't have Nix installed on your computer, you can still use Rix to generate the expressions for you. And this is useful because then you generate an expression and you can maybe put it you know, on GitHub Actions or somewhere else on a server and it will run there. Uh, you can also you know, write specific versions of packages like this. Uh, you can install packages hosted on GitHub. And we have really a lot of different vignettes to get you started. Uh, we have all these vignettes that you can read that will help you get uh, acquainted with Nix and with Rix. So we tried to write really a lot of text to make it as uh, smooth as possible for new users. 
Uh, yes, so we can start with the demo. Maybe just before that, do we have a question? I see some new messages. Oh, those are the links. Yes, thank you. Do we have <clears throat> a question before I continue with the next demo? Okay, so let me go with the demo then. Okay, so for the demo, um, maybe I could use, yeah, I mean, I could show it inside of here. Uh, we have this Nix expressions folder. Let me just close this. And basically, uh, so here, this is a, this Nix expression here, this is a Nix expression that is very complex, but that I, I, I put there because it, it has all these comments that explain the structure to you. So maybe read that because it should explain everything that is going on. But again, we are not going to write all of this, okay? Uh, be uh, uh, assured, we're not going to write all of this. This is going to be generated for us, but it has all these different uh, comments that you can read. So this is inside of basic, but then what is more interesting for us is the RICS intro. So the RICS intro, what we see here, we see we have these two R files. We have one here, R Studio, and one here, uh, VS Code. So let me just set this as the working directory, and maybe let me remove this and this. Let me remove that. I don't need that for now. Okay, so let me open. So as you see, uh, here I have still some uh, some French comments for because I did a workshop uh, in France uh, two months ago. And this was the code from that workshop. I can remove them, but that's fine. So I, I have, I load RICS and I say, well, I want this version of R, I want these packages and this stuff. So I'm going to run that now. And as you see, it created now this default.nix. And if I look at this default.nix, you know, it's written that it was generated by nix and it has all this code that I'm not going to read but this was generated for you. And what I can do now is I can say, okay, now I wanna use this. Okay, I wanna use this thing. So I'm going to go uh, in the right folder. So where am I? Yeah, I'm in the right spot. So if I cat into default, you see I, I have my, my, my thing here. And so now I'm going to use Nix build. So if I run Nix build, it's going to build basically this development shell. So maybe it's going to take some time because uh, I, I I don't think I built that one yet. Uh, but we don't we don't I actually know. I actually had built it already, so it went very quickly because uh, I already had everything. So let's run Nix shell now. So Nix shell is going to put me inside of that environment. Basically, once I enter that, that shell here, if I do, for example, R version, I have here R version 4.3.1, okay? But this is inside of this Nix shell. If I get if I get out and if I do, I don't think I even, I, yeah, I do have R installed on my, on my Linux, but if I do R version, yeah, I have this version here, 4.4.1, okay? But if I enter the shell, I, I have another version, okay? If I now run, uh, so I, it takes a bit of time to enter the shell, but once I'm there, I have version 4.3.1. And if you remember the expression, I said that I wanted uh, RStudio. So, you know, let's try to run it and let's see if it works. It should work, but you know, live, you never know. Yeah, here it is. So this now is a version of RStudio that is running on this older version of R, on R4.3.1, and it should also be uh, an older version of RStudio. It's RStudio 22, July 22, from two years ago, basically. And this is the RStudio that, that I have with a more recent version here. And if I look at here, this is from the April 2024. <laughs> so I'm running two different versions of RStudio, with two different versions of R for two different projects, okay? And this is inside, this is running from my computer, okay? This is not inside a container 
or it's not inside uh, whatever, this is something that is totally working like any other piece of software from my computer. So I can use it to interact with all the files in my computer. I don't need to mount a volume. I don't need to do anything special. I just have here my packages, okay? I have here dplyr 1.1.2 that I can use for my analysis. And in my other one, uh, in this one that is more recent, I have dplyr 1.1.4, okay? Which uh, I think is different. Yeah, this one is 1.1.2, the other one is 1.1.4. And so I can have, at the same time, completely different versions, and it's always going to be exactly the same. And the reason it's always going to be exactly the same is because I said I want this version, and in the default.nix file, it puts this commit number here. And it's written even in the comments, it's written here, it uses Nix packages revision so-and-so for reproducibility purposes. And so it's always going to install exactly the same software. So if now I, I, I want something else, so let's say, okay, I don't want, you know, I don't want uh, our studio. Uh, I'm going, I get out of my shell. And now I say, well, uh, let's say that I have here another one. Yeah, VS Code. So I have another one with VS Code. So I have here my, my French comments, but I can remove them. Here, instead of our studio, I put code. And so if I generate this one, so I need to put overwrite true because I already have a default.nix. If I, if I run this one, now, if I look at the details, I don't have our studio anymore. I just have language server that was added to interact with Visual Studio Code. So if you're working with Visual Studio Code, you can do it like this. If you're working with our studio, you do it you do it uh, like this, where you put our studio. If you use something else, you can put other. If you use nothing, you put other as well. Uh, this thing over here, this is just for Linux. This has nothing now to do uh, with, uh, this is not something that you need to remember. It's something that is documented and is something that I need on my computer. Uh, because I have a weird setup, but you know, on other computers, you might not need that on other Linux computers, I say. Okay, so do we have... Uh, uh, do, so does Nick solve the scars issue of reproducibility related to hardware? No, no, it doesn't, unfortunately. Oh, I mean, yes and no. So basically, uh, Nix supports a lot of different hardware. Uh, so there's a lot, really a lot of different hardware that is supported, but... Um, you have on one hand Nix, the package manager, that you can install on a lot of different things. But then you have Nix, uh, the, the, the packages themselves, right? They are packaged for specific versions of hardware. So they are packaged for uh, ARM64. So for example, on Linux, that would be Raspberry Pis. Or on AMD64, so that would be like this normal Intel type processors, AMD processors. For Mac, the uh, packages, the R packages on Nix and R itself is packaged for um, uh, M1, M2, M3 now, and also for the older Intel versions. So it's basically packed, packaged for that. And on Windows, uh, basically Nix on Windows, it's basically using uh, Visual Studio, um, Windows subsystem for Linux. So it's basically Linux. It's the same thing as Linux, basically. So the hardware still will have an impact because you 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 cannot install all of these packages anywhere. But, you know, uh, hardware differences on results are very rare. It can happen. And depending on your field, it might happen more often than, than not, but it's usually very rare. But yeah, unfortunately, hardware is very difficult to, because you cannot, you know, if you, if you have that processor and if that processor handles floating points numbers differently than others, then, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so unfortunately, you don't can't really do much there. Uh, I think I saw another question. At this time, we installed a specific R version, but the latest version of dplyr. Yeah. So not so the the thing is uh, when you when you do uh, something like this, for example, this is going to install this version of R, and it's going to install the version of dplyr that was current at that time. If you want a different version of dplyr, you can add at, you know, and then you put one point uh, whatever, something like this. You can do that, but you cannot use R and Witnix, okay? In fact, actually, um, 
even okay actually i'm surprised this shouldn't be running actually the ah yeah no i know why it's running because i'm running from another but let's go back to the intro let's go back to this one yeah so let's let me go back to the shell that i did before so this is the shell that i built using um this is the shell that i did using the um okay why it's building now oh yeah it's building because it's sorry it's building because it's uh, the the default is the one from from code. Let me go back to the one from our studio, and let me remove this, and let me go back to this thing. Yeah. So if I go here, and if I say, okay, I am in this version of I have this version of R, uh, with this version of dplyr that was current right at the time, and now I start I start R in the terminal. If I do something like this, uh, maybe let me. If I do install.packages dplyr or something else, it should, yeah, I, I have this error. I have this error that tells me, look, you are running R from Nix. So don't install packages using install.packages, add them to the default.nix file instead. So basically this is kind of like Docker, where if you wanna add packages or update them, you need to rebuild the development environment, okay? Uh, yes, so you you make a good point here. During the uh, during R four point three point one, there were probably uh, different versions of dplyr. So the thing is, as I as I said, the R packages that we get when we use Nix, they are not coming from CRAN. They are coming from the GitHub repository, and this is uh, you know we manage that together. It's a small team. And basically what we do is that we update that at each release of R, we update the packages. The reason we do that is because we cannot update it every day. We can't do that. Uh, it takes too much work and we need to run tests and we need to build every package on uh, continuous integration platforms. And so it, it just takes too many resources. And unfortunately we don't have the, uh, the means and the resources to do it every day like CRAN. So we do it roughly like every six months, uh, which is not ideal. Uh, we, we recognize that, but we have, uh, and I will explain that at the end, we have uh, an alternative that you can use if you really need uh, as uh, you know very recent packages. Now regarding specific versions, if you need, for example, if you want to mix versions of packages for now, this is not something that you can easily do with Nix because Nix has, it's more of this snapshot uh, based thing, right? If you go here, uh, you have, this is kind of a snapshot. Uh, let me just scroll up. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is it? Yeah, no, not, not this one. This one, yeah. This is kind of a snapshot. Like if you were using uh, the POSIT package manager at a specific date. So this is kind of a snapshot where you get the system as it is at that time right at the time of this commit. We are currently thinking about how can we make, um, how can we manage things like RN where we basically get specific versions of packages. We are thinking about that. We are thinking about writing a function called RN to Nix where you give it an RN file and it will generate a default.nix file for you with the right versions. But it's not a very easy problem to solve because RNV and Nix are are very different in how they manage dependencies because RNV manage ver, manages versions, right? And Nix in this case here is more of a snapshot based thing. You can manage versions as well with Nix. You can do that, but it's a bit more complex and it's due to the to the release schedule of uh, R packages on Nix uh, where we manage that. And we cannot unfortunately do it every day. So I see I have 15 minutes left and I still wanna show you something. I think I will show you this and then maybe uh, we can do the questions because the rest is a bit more complicated. The other thing I wanna show you is if I, I wanna go back to uh, having a pipeline. So if I have this pipeline over here, maybe I can save. Let me just open. If I have this pipeline over here, right? I want to run this pipeline 
in the right with the right version of R with the right version of uh, my packages. And so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this environment, okay, where I'm going to set the right version of R, set the right packages, download Pandoc to compile my markdown, download a, a package from Git and so on and so forth. And actually I don't even need that anymore in the latest version of, Fus in, uh, of the latest version of, of uh, uh, Rix. Uh, and then I'm going to go in when when I'm going to start the environment. I'm going to run my targets pipeline, okay. And if I run this thing, it's going to generate this file here, okay. And so let's let's see what happens when I go there. Uh, let me get out of here. Where am I? Am I here? Yeah. Okay, so I have my pipeline. Uh, uh, no, my pipeline is here. I have this script, okay? That this script that generated this default.nix. And so let me build. Now I hope it's not going to take too much time. So I'm going to build this default, uh, the, yeah, this default.nix, this environment. It's done because I already had it cached. And now if I run Nix shell, it should run my pipeline with the right packages. So just by running Nix shell, it should run everything. So as you see, it built here, it started and it built my stuff. So what was my stuff? If I go back to my targets here, it basically it built everything and it compiled this markdown, which means that now I should have I should have over here an HTML file. Yeah, here it is. As you see from the timestamp, it was executed now. So again, if I go here and I do Brave Browser Analysis HTML, I should, here it is, I, I see it now, okay? And if I change my analysis, oops, yeah, here it is. If I change my analysis, so for example, let's say I remove, I remove Schengen. By the way, Schengen, uh, the commune here in Luxembourg that gave its name to the Schengen area that we all know and love. So if I now I, I will you know, rerun my analysis, I don't need to build it again, the environment. The environment is done. I was just going to rerun my analysis to drop by dropping again in the Nix shell. And as you see, it's even skipping, it's skipping the stuff that wasn't uh, affected by my change. It's just starting the communes, which is I removed Schengen, so it needs to rebuild it, and then it runs my uh, uh, my my uh, it it compiles here my uh, my analysis again, and as you see, no more Schengen. So if I put Schengen back, and if I save, actually I I don't even need. So I'm still in my shell here, right? I'm still in my in my shell. I don't even need to. To 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 get out of here, I could just you know start R, and then I could uh, run targets, R make. So here I'm doing that interactively because I can use it interactively. It's like it's installed on my computer. And here again, if I update, here it is. Schengen is back. So basically, using Nix, I can just install at the user level. I can just install any software that I want, that I need, and I can use it interactively. I can install our studio and I can use it. Uh, I can install all of these packages and I can use them and it works quite well. Uh, maybe the very last thing I want to show you uh, is that you can also then combine Nix and Docker. So if you, if you combine here, you have a Docker file and this Docker file, basically what it does is that it's, it's going to install Rix, it's going to install Rix, it's going to install Nix, and then at the end, it's just going to start a Nix shell, and basically, it's going to have this version of R and this version of packages, right? And so if I if I show you that, maybe, so now I have, um, uh, where am I? Let me just see, yeah. So now I have a Docker file, okay? And again, this Docker file, is going to just install 
uh, you know, it's just going to install Nix and it's going to run, generate my environment inside of uh, Docker. And so basically it's going to install, it's going to install this. It's going to install this software for me. So if I build this Docker image, uh, Docker build, yeah. If I build this, well here, everything is cached because I did it already. But now if I run it, Docker run, uh, oops, that was it. Uh, crap. Let me just Docker. Yeah. So no, uh, sorry, Docker run, not Docker build, Docker, here it is. So now it should drop me inside of that Nix shell inside of Docker. So let's see, yeah, here it is. So now this Nix shell here, this is running inside Docker. So if I, if I, if I, uh, you know, so it started the R session immediately because I put here in my shell, I put that it should start R. And in my Docker file, I put that when I enter Docker, it should start to the shell. So it starts the shell and the shell starts R. And that's why now I'm inside Docker, inside that Nix shell. And if I get out of R, if I quit R, here, as you see, I'm inside of uh, the Nix shell inside of Docker. So if I do something like you name A, this is inside of my uh, of my this is inside of the Docker image. Okay, this thing. And now if I get out of the Docker, uh, I get out of the shell as well. So you can combine both. So I think I need to stop here because uh, we have nine minutes left, and perhaps you have questions. I I still want to show you yeah, Inception indeed. Um, and the question, is it idea to build Docker by wrapping NIST or by using Nix, I guess? Uh, I mean, depends a bit what you want. Um, what I what I think uh, is nice is that when you use Docker and Nix, you have a very good separation of concerns. On one hand, you have Docker that you can use to uh, to, to basically serve applications, right? So you, you can use uh, Docker to, to, to deploy stuff and containers. And then you have Nix to actually, inside of the Docker, really make uh, everything reproducible. Um, so how do you find the needed system packages? Well, the needed system packages are basically the ones that you, you need. So for example, if you need our studio, uh, you would put it there. Uh, or if you need, uh, I don't know, if you need Pandoc to compile uh, your, your, uh, your uh, markdown, uh, uh, GDAL, uh, no, so GDAL is going to be taken care of. So because GDAL is a dependency of the R packages that require it. So actually I can show you that. Um, I can show you that, for example, if you go here, so these are, this is on, this is on, um, this is on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on GitHub. And basically these are the definitions of the R packages. And you see, for example, this thing here, this package is here. This is an R package, LWGOM. And it has as dependencies, opla, what the hell? It has as dependencies, these three things. And these are system level packages. And so when you will install LWGOM, these things are going to be installed with it because they are listed as dependencies. And this file is curated by hand by volunteers like myself, but not just myself, far from it, because I not uh, good enough with Nix to, to do all the crazy things that you can read here, but it's uh, curated by, by uh, actual people to, to make sure that everything works when you need it. Uh, so we had still, uh, uh, yeah, so Docker is taking care of the OS compatibility issues while Nix, no, actually Nix takes care of uh, also the OS level library. So as I said, for example, GDAL here, that's that's a system that's a system level dependency. And it's going, and so Nix is going to take care of that. What Docker does for you, if you combine it with Nix, you don't have to. For example, what I showed you here was without Docker, just the very last demo What was, was with Docker. But what Docker gives you is the ability to basically use the already existing, very widely uh, adopted Docker infrastructure. So for example, at work, we use Docker. We use Docker to deploy stuff. And we use Docker with Kubernetes to deploy stuff. 
And so this means that I cannot just now go there to the IT people and tell them, look, uh, we don't need Doc anymore. I can just use Nix. So instead, uh, I've wrapped Nix stuff inside of the Docker images. And so I deploy my stuff uh, using Docker. But the the inside the Docker, right, all the dependencies and all the environment is uh, handled by Nix. Well, actually, it's not yet handled. We are in an exploration phase uh, because at work, uh, you know, things take more time. But in my uh, in my personal projects, I, I just use Nix now. Uh, yeah, so Nix deals with that by the fact that uh, whenever we do a release, right? Of uh, so the question is. Um, the question is, you know, different packages of SF, for example, or different versions of SF did different, uh, you know, versions of PROS and GEOS, etc. Basically, what we do is that each time we have a release of uh, all our CRAN packages, we fix all the errors. So all these packages that you see here, all the packages from CRAN and Bioconductor get built on continuous integration platform called Hydra. And we get all the error messages and so we fix everything. So if there is a version mismatch, we fix that and then we release it. So you shouldn't have any problems when you are going to do that, when you are going to use Nix. I say shouldn't because sometimes, uh, again, some errors uh, fall through the cracks and we haven't fixed it yet for you. But again, if you have an issue, uh, just let us know. Um, but everything that is here in this file should work. And when I say should, it's really must work uh, because if not, there is a there there really was a big problem. Usually, things that don't work and that we don't realize work are packages like Torch, for example. Torch is a package that technically works because you can install it using Nix. But then, when you run Torch for the first time, it wants to download actually the Torch executable to run your model to 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 execute your models. And so we didn't realize that because the Torch R package itself, it's going to install. But when you then want to use Torch to actually install the actual executable code, that is not going to work. So we are actually in the, in the process of fixing it. We have a pull request open at the moment to actually fix it. Because I realized that uh, two weeks ago, I wanted to use Torch. And so it worked. I could install it. But then... Torch asks to install more stuff, and that's not that didn't work. So now we have a PR to actually fix it. So it's this kind of things that might still be problematic. Uh, I think I saw um, just in case you know about it. I heard of Podman as an alternative to Docker. Yeah. So uh, my take on Podman, as far as I know, uh, is that it's more of a of a kind of a license, at least at work. So now we have Docker and Podman at work. And from my understanding, it was more a, a problem of licensing issues with uh, with Docker. So uh, Docker changed their their commercial licenses, I think, two years ago or something like that, and uh, it, it got more expensive, made it more restrictive in some cases, etc. And so we are shifting towards Podman. But from my understanding, it's supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one drop in replacement. So you could use Podman. So Podman build and Podman run instead of Docker build and Docker run. And that's my understanding, but I, I don't have first-hand experience with it yet because I am still on, on Docker. And and yeah, it's also, yeah, the licensing, you know, I guess Podman is is really, you know, free and open source software where Docker has this kind of mixed half commercial, half kind of open, but not really open license. So yeah, it's a, that's also a, one of the, uh, one of the points. Yeah. Um, we have one minute. Do we have more questions? Again, I know this was a lot. This was really a, a, an information dump. Uh, sorry about that. There was a lot of things, but yeah, just reach out uh, if you have more questions, if you want help. Uh, if you're interested in Nix, uh, just you know, read the uh, the, the the vignettes. Uh, we tried to make them as clear as possible. Hopefully. Uh, this is the case. And regarding R and regarding functional programming, et cetera, et cetera, uh, well, take a take a look at the book. Uh, and and yeah, just yeah, don't hesitate to reach out uh, if you have uh, any questions. I'll be more than happy to to answer. I I see people uh, commenting. Thank you for all the kind 
kind of messages. And uh, yeah, actually, I might I might update the book uh, to include Nix, but I still don't know if I should update the book to include Nix, or if I should maybe write something else specific on Nix. I'm still in the fence on the fence about that. What I'm currently doing is I'm I'm writing a Python version of the book actually, um, to yeah to to explain it's it's Python but with a very uh, R heavy accent. So uh, we'll see how how the Python community uh, uh, takes that up because I'm not doing any loops. I'm using functional programming. I'm using uh, lists and so on. So uh, I think it'll be interesting for them. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was awesome. So Thank you. Thank you. yeah, we we are uh, going to share the recording on our YouTube channel, and uh, we'll post everything on our social network. So we'll let you know soon about uh, as soon as the recording is available. Great. Thank you. Well, again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and yeah, see you soon, I guess, on social media or on YouTube or you know, and some other uh, Our Ladies event. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.